Hi again, I'm Neil. This chapter is on magnetic fields. Now, everyone's heard of the Northern Lights or the Aurora Borealis or the Australis uh, Borealis. Uh, maybe if you've never been fortunate enough to go to the extreme latitudes north and south of the planet in wintertime, brave the cold, uh, in total darkness to see the beauty of the Northern Lights, you can just take a look at this picture here. Uh, the Northern Lights are quite the natural phenomena. Nature's 4th of July, where the atmosphere high above our heads, maybe 100 miles or so, is literally on fire. The burning of oxygen and nitrogen gas molecules uh, as they collide with the charged particles, mostly protons and electrons, from the sun. Now, this is only possible in, a, in the extreme uh, cryospheres in the northern and southern latitudes because of the magnetic field of the Earth, which channels charged particles from the sun towards the polar regions. And it is these charged particles that are being channeled by the magnetic field that surrounds our planet. Uh, they, these particles crash into the upper levels of the atmosphere and they generate uh, things like the aurora borealis. So uh, this chapter is all about uh, the nature of uh, magnetism and magnetic fields. So if we take a look at what's in our chapter uh, for today's topic, uh, the, the birthplace of magnetism, as far as we know, uh, is in central Greece, a region actually called Magnesia. And where in the days of antiquity, uh, the story goes that lodestones, which uh, now we know are some form of iron oxide, uh, lodestones as they call them, seem to display properties of attraction and repulsion. And this is the earliest evidence that we know of, uh, of the discovery of magnetism. Now, when we talked uh, on the chapter about electric fields, when we talked about charges, you know, uh, opposite charges and uh, similar charges, they either attract or they repel each other because of the interaction of electric fields. That's how uh, the field of electrostatics uh, work. You know, so we can have an individual negative charge, like an electron, or an individual positive charge, like a proton. They can exist independently. However, if you want to bring them relatively close together and let them interact, you know, that disturbance of space between them, that's what a field is, a disturbance of space, it will produce either an attractive or repulsive force. Uh, the point being here that uh, with electric charges, the negative and positive charges are independent and they can, co they can coexist or they can exist by themselves, completely independent of the other. Therein lies the one big difference with magnetic fields, with magnetism. If we consider a magnet, and maybe you've played with a magnet, you know, when you're a kid, uh, you know that if you brought the two north poles together, you know, they repel each other. But if you brought a uh, north and a south pole, they would attract each other. So this force of attraction or repulsion, much like with electric charges, uh, is due to the interaction of a magnetic field. Now, if we scroll down the chapter here, um, we can take a typical bar magnet and represent the north and the south poles on here. And we show the electric field, the, I'm sorry, the magnetic field lines. The magnetic field line, like the electric field lines, uh, they have direction and magnitude. Now with the electric field lines, the, the closer the lines are spaced together, the greater the magnitude. Now as far as the direction goes, uh, it, a tangent drawn to the field line at any point of interest uh, shows the direction of the field at that point. Well, it's a similar story for magnetic fields. Now, I, again, in the reference is to electric fields. You know, electric fields, the, the field lines originate from positive charges and they end at negative charges. So they diverge from positive charges and they converge at negative charges. For magnetism, a similar story can be written where the magnetic field lines, they diverge from the North Pole and they conclude or converge at the South Pole. However, this is only on the outside of the magnet. Herein lies the fundamental difference uh, between our discussion on electric fields, electric charges, and magnetism, magnets and magnetic fields. It is impossible, as we currently know it, to separate a North Pole from a South Pole. They must coexist. So unlike the electric charges where you could have independent positive and negative charges, electrons and protons, that is not possible uh, as far as we know. 
So the bottom line is magnetic monopoles don't exist. A caveat to that story is that they are predicted uh, theoretically to exist. They haven't been discovered uh, at the time of the making of this video at least. So magnetic monopoles don't exist. Which means that the magnetic field lines must form closed loops. If the field lines emanate or diverge from the North Pole and or converge at the South Pole outside of the magnet, in order to form a perfectly closed loop, the field direction has to change direction on the inside of the magnet. That is to say, on the inside of the magnet, the magnetic field lines are directed from the South Pole towards the North Pole. And on the outside, they begin at the North Pole and end at the South Pole, thereby forming closed loops. And this is all due to the fact that monopoles don't exist, so closed loops must prevail at all times. Uh, it doesn't matter the, the shape of the magnet, a simple bar magnet or uh, a horseshoe magnet, for example. You know, so the magnetic field lines outside of the horseshoe magnet goes from the North Pole to the South Pole. But the inside of the magnet, they change direction from the South Pole to the North Pole. So again, similar to uh, with the electric field uh, uh, intensity and direction, the closer uh, the spacing of the um, magnetic field line that is closer to the poles, North or South, the stronger the field, the greater the intensity, right? Uh, but the direction of the magnetic field is found by drawing a tangent to uh, the magnetic field line at the point of interest. Right? So a very similar story, again, with the electric fields. Um, so uh, the nature of magnetism, uh, it's, um, it's actually quite complicated and well beyond the scope of this particular level of physics. Uh, but it, it has to do, uh, the origin of this has to do with the electron itself. So, an electron is a negative charge, uh, and it's, uh, it's a fundamental charge. In electrons, they don't just orbit around a the nucleus, they actually spin like a little planet does, uh, spinning on its own axis. Uh, so, it's charge, and it's moving charge. So, moving charges constitute a magnetic field. So, this is the nature of magnetism at really its heart, its traceable heart. Uh, it's a spinning electron that generates. Uh, so every you could think of every electron as being a tiny magnet. So if you look at a slightly larger scale, if you look at an atom that has an unpaired electron, um, that's different from an uh, atom with where all of the electrons are paired up. They've got a partner. And when they pair up, uh, it tends to have one electron spinning in one direction and its neighbor that it pairs up with, they're called Cooper pairs, spinning in the opposite direction. So in one of these electrons, the magnetic dipole, as it's called, points in one direction and it, with its neighbor, it points in the opposite direction. So the net effect of the magnetism, the overall magnetism, uh, is zero. But when you have the case of an unpaired electron, it has no buddy, if you will, no buddy system to pair up with with an opposite spin. So a net magnetic field, whether it be you know, up or down, uh, exists and the overall effect is felt as uh, a magnetic material. Okay. Um, in much more detail than I'm going to go into in this introductory video is found in this chapter painstakingly uh, showed many aspects of physics that all led up to the properties of magnetism. Many things that the reader may or may not find interesting. I hope the reader does find interesting. Fundamental principles such as the uncertainty principle, for example, the Werner-Heisenberg principle, um, for wave functions, etc. So I've really taken the time to give a, um, an account of the nature of uh, atomic structure and the properties of what are called a magnetic uh, uh, quantum number, uh, how it's derived you know, from the different states of which a fundamental particle can exist. Um, so I'll leave it for the reader to get what they can from this chapter. This is the uh, 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 Erwin Schrödinger's wave equation, and this plays a part uh, uh, in all properties uh, at the quantum level. So magnetism really goes down to a quantum level uh, as well. So things such as uh, the principal quantum number, magnetic quantum number, angular quantum number, spin quantum number, they all play a part in determining the, pro the fundamental properties of magnetism and you know, several other things. So the reader can get quite a, a fundamental knowledge of how all of this is put together 
with this chapter. And you know, this diagram depicts that an electron can either spin clockwise or counterclockwise, so it spins up or down, and that determines uh, the direction of the of the dipole moment. Um, you know for that particular electron. So all of that is described in great detail uh, in this chapter. Um, and there's an experiment called the stirling gerlach experiment, which is derived here, that actually proved that electrons can only have one of two spins, up or down, and that determines whether it, you know, it, how the orientation, if you will, of that tiny electron as a magnet, where the North Pole and the South Pole of the electron, is it, you know, facing this way or is it facing this way? So, uh, the reader will you know, get a description of this stern girl like experiment, which took a bunch of silver atoms, shot it through uh, a non-uniform magnetic field, uh, north and south magnetic poles, and uh, electrons, uh, the atoms rather, got deflected in only one of two directions as they hit a screen. And that was indicative that the electrons with those silver atoms, uh, they were either pointing in one direction or another, either up or down, and that determined the north or the south poles interacting with the permanent north and south poles of the magnet uh, here that the silver atoms had to have gone through before they got to the detector screen. So it's uh, really a phenomenal experiment, but it proves without a shadow of a doubt that electrons can be magnets and they only have one way or another, spin up or spin down, that they can exist. Uh, yeah, so uh, quite a bit of description here now was talked about uh, on the Earth. The Earth is just like a, a giant bar magnet, so to speak. Deep within the Earth, thousands of kilometers beneath your feet is the molten iron outer core. And the outer core, because it's molten, it's churning. It's actually upwelling and circulating up and down every half a billion years or so, very slowly, by our standards of measurement of, of motion. But it's moving. Um, and this motion generates an electric current and all electric currents generate a magnetic field. This is the source of the Earth's magnetic field. And the reader will be interested to know, and which is all dealt with in this chapter, the magnetic field that's being generated far beneath your feet that you have no clue that exists unless someone points it out to you, like I just did. Uh, this magnetic field uh, does some important things for us, not just uh, makes the aurora borealis, the northern lights, possible for us to see this, you know, beautiful light show uh, in the heavens. But this magnetic field also uh, shields a life on a planet from very, very dangerous uh, charged particles, cosmic radiation coming in from our sun and from the trillions of other stars in the heavens as well. Hard to imagine any life had a, could have gotten going, let alone get to this stage of development, if we're not for the shield of this uh, magnetic field of the planet. So I've taken the time to explain in great detail with this diagram how the magnetic field of the Earth is generated. I think the, uh, the reader will be quite enthusiastic about learning about how this happens. Now, the magnetic field is not consistent everywhere on the planet. So I've shown some pictures of here of some place that I've been to. This is in the far north and uh, <clears throat> in, in the far Arctic, uh, in the north of the planet. Now, this is uh, in Canada. This is... Um, both of these pictures here uh, in uh, close to Nunavut. Nunavut uh, is a native Canadian Indian word. This is actually the North Magnetic Axis. Uh, it's very close to this area here where the North Magnetic, I'm sorry, the South Magnetic Axis of the Pole uh, exists. Uh, I, I, I said North Magnetic Pole because it's actually close to the North Geographic Pole. And most books will tell you that that's also close to the North Magnetic Pole. But this is not true. If you use a compass, the compass tells you you're going north, it will take you in this direction. But a compass will only align with the prevailing magnetic field of the Earth. So a compass, the North Pole of the compass has to align with the South Pole of the Earth's magnetic field. So in the Northern Hemisphere, close to the rotational axis, the rotational geographic North Pole, about 11 degrees off of that, about a thousand miles or so away, uh, nautically speaking, uh, is the South Magnetic Pole of the Earth. When your compass tells you you're heading north, you're actually heading to the South Magnetic Pole. It's a bit confusing. Read the chapter. It explains all of it. Um, so, navigation purposes and protection from deadly radiation from the sun, uh, two of the uses of this magnetic field that's being generated by the molten uh, core deep below uh, your, uh, the, your feet uh, in the interior of the planet. Um, but I've got some bad news for you, though. Just uh, don't, don't get too used to this magnetic field. It turns out now that we know the magnetic orientation of the Earth, um, it flips 
180 degrees back and forth like this, uh, almost like clockwork every one million years or so. And it's been in this particular orientation where the south magnetic pole is in the northern hemisphere, currently in Nunavut, Canada, uh, and the north magnetic pole is uh, about a thousand miles from the south geographic pole in Antarctica, that orientation has been like that for about 750,000 years. The switch is on. Um, so in the mid-1900s or so, when the magnetic field was first measured at the planet, it's been decreasing in intensity uh, every single year by about 7%. It's actually fading now. And the orientation, the magnetic axis of the Earth is actually moving. It's moving by about 25 miles or so uh, every single year. And eventually, by the year 2050 or so, it will not be, the, the South Magnetic Pole will not be here in Nunavut, Canada. It'll, it'll be in Siberia, in, in Russia. Uh, and it'll be diminished uh, considerably more, weakened considerably more. And eventually, it's going to disappear altogether. So what's going to happen then? Well, your compass is not going to work for a while until the switch is complete. And, uh, and this becomes the North Magnetic Pole, and the South Magnetic Pole shows up in the actual Southern Hemisphere. That's currently the North Magnetic Pole. Uh, sounds confusing? Again, read the chapter. It explains all of it. Um, so what happens when the magnetic field disappears? Uh, well, I don't know. Good luck. <laughs> uh, so as we scroll a bit further down here, um, I painstakingly talk about uh, how much of the aurora the northern lights. This is in Reykjavik, Iceland. This is in uh, Tromsø, uh, Norway. So these are some of the uh, places on Earth where you can go see in wintertime. Uh, the magnetic field, and there are several problems on calculating the magnetic field at different places on Earth. That's what this diagram is about. So the user is going to get a whole lot of uh, uh, useful information out of these uh, worked problems. The magnetic force, we'll talk about this as well. Um, the magnetic field exerts a force uh, um, on charged particles that are moving. Uh, within the magnetic field and we can calculate what that force is and it's actually quite useful this magnetic force in particle accelerators as uh, charged particles are injected uh, uh, in inside of a ring of uh, powerful magnets uh, and every go around the magnetic field exerts a force um, and depending on the direction in which the uh, the velocity vector points for the charged particle that was introduced uh, we can make this force be always directed to the center of rotation so we can keep the charged particles moving in a circle and every time they make a loop their velocity increases until they get very close to the speed of light so we introduce target molecules nuclei and let these very fast moving charged particles crash into them split the nucleus open and that's called uh, nuclear fission right splitting the atoms so this nuclear force is used in particle accelerators um, so Many things to consider over here, helical motion, this is what happens to charged particles uh, as they move around the magnetic field of the Earth. Uh, they actually look like a little slinky as they do this. Um, it's pretty cool actually how that would work if you could see it happening. So the reader is going to, I think, find that quite interesting. And as with every chapter, there are numerous worked examples, uh, several worked examples at least. So the reader is going to have a really good understanding. Um, of how this magnetism works and how it's measured. And this particular diagram I took when I was um, in Ecuador. This is a Chimborazo volcano. This actually is, if you could be at the summit over here, I attempted the summit but didn't quite make it. Uh, at the summit here, you actually would be at the furthest point from the center of the Earth. It is not Mount Everest, that's the highest mountain from sea level. But this volcano, Chimborosa uh, <coughs> volcano, which is 6,263 meters high, the summit of this is the single furthest point from the center of our planet. So there's a problem on here that calculates if you could have made the summit like I didn't make. Uh, what would the magnetic field magnitude and direction be at the furthest point from the center of the Earth? It's actually quite a fascinating uh, um, problem. So uh, I hope you find this interesting uh, and very educational. Once again, I thank you for your time.